Cool. Hey, everybody. I'm Greg from Oxen, and we were doing some internal book club for a while with the team every Friday to make us smarter Oxen, and we were kind of loving it. Uh, one of our team members left and wanted to keep coming. So we were like, why don't we just make this a public thing for everybody? And oh, we have more people popping in live. Cool. So today we're going to be going through uh, training language models to follow instructions with human feedback. And what this paper is probably most well known for is being the tech behind ChatGPT. Um, so the way we tend to do this book club is I'll, I have a bunch of notes that I took throughout the paper. Um, if you guys have read it and want to chime in at any point, let me know. And uh, we'll just kind of go through. We'll go through it in chronological order of the paper. So if you have that up on the side too, I'll, I'll let you know when we're in the abstract or introduction or whatever it might be. But this paper from OpenAI was, the paper was released in March, 2022 as just like a generic timeline. Here's the abstract uh, on archive. And they have a GitHub with some example data, which I found pretty helpful as I was reading the paper, just to get a sense of what actually came in and out of these models. And chat GPT was released in November of 2022. So I don't have any insider baseball here, but you can imagine from March to November, they were kind of collecting data, iterating on this process and then released chat GPT, which is kind of a evolution of GPT-3. So the idea behind training language models to follow instructions from human feedback is that they were doing a lot of experiments with making models bigger, adding more data. We went through the GPT-2 paper last week and they had this big aha moment of, okay, they made just a generic language model that's here to predict the next word, uh, have a hundred or a billion, parameters, they called it GPT-2, and they realized they could start doing more things than they expected. And feel free to go to last week's book club to kind of see examples of that. But making language models bigger doesn't inherently make them better at following a user's intent. So just adding more and more unstructured data and web crawls just doesn't make it aligned with their users inherently. They call this alignment. You might have heard that terminology in the space, and they really define what that means later in the paper. They talk about how they collected a data set of user input from the OpenAI API, uh, which they use to fine tune GPT-3. Uh, they collect a data set of ranked model outputs, which they use to further fine tune it from reinforcement learning. And we'll talk about what that means later um but the big kind of like if you don't remember anything else from this is it's called instruct gpt they had a model called gpt3 that was 175 billion parameters and with this instruct method they were able to train one that was 100 times smaller in terms of parameters so it can run way faster much more efficient but had outputs that were preferred by humans to the 175 billion parameter model. And they kind of evaluated it on three different metrics of truthfulness, uh, uh, helpfulness and harmlessness. And they define those later, but pretty cool that you can like just through data, reduce the model size by hundred X um, and then productionalize it like that. So we've kind of seen how these models can generate different outputs given examples at hand. Um, I actually have some examples later where we'll do this live with Llama, or not live, but I have some screenshots and 
it's kind of been cool to see how the community like has taken a base model llama has fine-tuned it for one task has fine-tuned it from a different task and you get like all different outputs depending on how you prompt it and how it was fine-tuned um but the base language model's objective was just like predicting the next word of text um which is much different from the objective of follow the user's instructions helpfully and safely um so they ca they call these models misaligned and they want to avoid unintended behaviors when like deploying a chat gpt out into production in reality so the three things that they're optimizing for are helpfulness does this solve the user's task at hand honesty it shouldn't fabricate information and harmlessness uh, whether you're in the physical or psychological realm we don't want these models to cause harm to people so they hired a team of 40 contractors to label their data vetted the contractors via a screen screening test before they let them label but they created three data sets here and it's kind of a three-step process of going from the raw language model to this fine-tuned language model that is helpful honest and harmless and so the first data set they call it a structured fine-tuning data set and it's essentially a prompt and the desired response that they want from that prompt so an example of that in json to be concrete um, is the prompt might be write me a song about an ox plowing a field of data and the response might be surely here's a song about an ox plowing a field of data blah 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 and so these 40 contractors that they hired they had them look through prompts that were submitted to the OpenAI playground back when GPT-3 was first released and they were just having people kick the tires. And they had these contractors read a, read a prompt and type out what they wanted the response, response to be manually. So this is like a very resource int intensive process just to collect this structured fine tuning data set. Pretty expensive too, if you think about paying 40 people to collect that data. The second data set that they collect is a reward model data set. And of course, my formatting <laughs> gets all crazy when we get into Notion. But this is also human labeled data. And the idea is, OK, given a prompt we're going to have the model output or a series of models output different candidate responses so you could imagine that same prompt that we had before write me a song about an ox plowing a field you could have three different candidate responses from three different models or just models with slightly different settings on them and one response might be ox go plow one me might be you got it ox go plow make no sound data so wow and the third might be <laughs> sure ox go plow and they present this to a human and the human ranks which one it prefers so one through three which one would you rather have the model spit out that's what the reward model data set looks like and then <laughs> number two, Scott votes for number two. I also vote for data so wow. Jessica agrees. <laughs> then the last data set that they collect is actually a data set that is more automatically generated and based off of the first two, but with a uh, reinforcement learning algorithm in the middle, um, which we'll cover a little later, but just to give you a sense of it, same prompt, they show one of the example outputs. They've trained a model to predict whether the human 
would like this or not. So you can imagine the model saying for that second example, oh, I think that's pretty good. I think that's like a 0.8. Um, but the expected reward is like, that is the best response we got. So they're trying to optimize the network further to given the information that the humans labeled here, try to get your responses as close to what a human would want as possible. So there's kind of three steps that they're going through here. And like those steps and where, where you think, where they think the benefit comes in, mm -hmm. like but obviously imagine them training this in a more supervised sense where it's just like each, we have these examples and they're either good or bad. Is it like the ranking that's special or is that like, is it the additional reinforcement learning step where they're training an additional model to do that ranking? Like what's kind of the, the chief innovation here in your eyes? It's a good question. And they have some plots that they get to later that I'll, I'll put in here. So you can think of, it's honestly easiest just to look at one of these at a time. And the blue line is a raw GPT. The green line is the first step of fine tuning. And then the orange and red line is the PPO, which is like the combination of the second two steps. So you can see they get a pretty significant bump from, um, let's see what the actual values on the X and Y axis are here. So the labelers went through and looked through and they kind of said, is this something that I would like as a response? And for the base model, it was like 25%. They liked it for the structured fine tuning, it was getting closer to 50%. And then with the uh, reinforcement learning, it was getting above 50%. So, so the RL that is helpful. Actually, yeah, totally. Feels like it, There's there's been some debate in the community of like people trying to reproduce this and uh, saying that they don't see as big of a bump as they would expect. And there's a little secret sauce maybe hidden in the paper that they don't fully get into all the details of that. But, um, and it's also very subjective on the data as well, I would add, right? Cause like what somebody likes isn't necessarily what everybody likes. So it could be that these labelers, um, they tried to hold out some of the labelers so that it's not the same person like doing the preference here and evaluating the model later, but inherently they're pulling from the same pool and they had some like boundaries of who they're hiring for this. So there's some debate about that too. Cool, great question. So they train three models, they said, all with the GPT-3 architecture of sizes 1.3 billion, 6 billion, and 175 billion. If you go back and look at the GPT-3 paper, they had comparisons of all those sizes of models. And the big thing here is they were like, can we take the GPT-3 1.3 model and make it better? than the 175 billion raw GPT model. And to get to slightly more numbers, uh, these are kind of like aggregate numbers on all the different scales of things they were looking for. So in the truthfulness domain, they said that instruct GPT generates truthful and informative answers twice as often as GP the raw GPT-3. Uh, and they had like closed domain question answering data sets. And they said that the hallucination rate drops from 41% to 21%. So an example of that would be like, I don't know, who's the president of the United States? And it just like generates a random name of a person versus the actual president. And even that is a little ambiguous because it's like, which year are you talking about? Is it the current year or last year or? 10 years ago. And then in terms of toxicity, they have this real toxicity prompts data set, a why no 
gender data set and a crowd s pairs data set and they said that instruct gpt generates 25 percent fewer toxic responses when prompted to be respectful in the prompt uh, they note that in the rlhf training the performance actually drops below GPT-3 on some of the data sets. So they, they evaluate this on a variety, just like they did on the GPT-2 paper last week. And they call this an alignment tax. So they're like, sure, you might be aligning it to be more or less toxic with its outputs, but then it kind of forgets some of the stuff that it learned and it might not do as well on other tasks. So they have some tricks to fi fix this later, but like, they kind of call it an alignment tax where you get better at one, you get better aligned with following instructions, but you perform worse on some of the other tasks. They also tested the following instruction capabilities and domains that were rare in the training data set. They said specifically code generation, code summarization, and following instructions in different languages weren't in their instruction data set, but they said qualitatively, uh, GPT-3 would require some very specific prompting. And they felt like instruct GPT was able to follow instructions in domains that it hadn't seen before. And so they had hypothesized that it like abstracted the idea of following instructions and could do it for stuff that it had never seen before. And just to give you some examples of the types, the distribution of categories that they collected, there's a bunch of different use cases. One is just generating text. So like generation might be write me a short story where a bear goes to the beach versus brainstorming might be list five ideas of how to regain enthusiasm for my career versus rewriting might be, this is a summary of a Broadway play, put the summary here. This is the outline of that play and it's trying to read the summary and create an outline. So a lot of their data set was the generation use case, almost 50% of it, and then kind of goes down from there from open QA, brainstorming, chat, rewriting, closed QA, et cetera. So the methodology in full, I kind of gave you a preview of this in the data above, but three-step process, collect a supervised training data set where it's like a prompt, explain the moon landing to a six-year-old, a labeler goes and types out a response to that. Some people went to the moon, dot, 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 and then fine tune GPT-3 with supervised learning of just, instead of generically predicting the next word, predict the next word given this more structured data here. And then the second step is, okay, now they've trained this model. They give the same prompt that model they generate four different variations on top of it and you can do this by sampling the model slightly differently so you might have seen like a temperature parameter when you're playing around with language models and if you set that to be high it's just going to generate the same thing every time but if you send it, set it to be slightly lower it's going to explore different words and different combinations of words so that would be one way that you could generate four different examples from the same model. You could also imagine having different models in this process, but they have a labeler just straight up rank those from D was better than C was better than A was better than B. They use this data to train a model called a reward model. And that reward model's job is just to look at a prompt, look at a response and give it a score we think this was a good response. The third step is, okay, going back to that first model we trained, given the second model we trained, put them in tandem, 
have the first model generate something, have the second model score it, and then optimize all the way back so that the first model tries to get its scores higher given the second model's opinion about it. So it's kind of like chaining them together. So we kind of talked about the data sets at a high level already in the data set section. They talk about how it was mainly collected from the GPT-3 playground, but does not use data from the API used in production. They deduplicate prompts that share a long common prefix, and they also limit the number of prompts to 200 per user ID, because you can imagine one user of the playground might be doing the same task over and over again, so they don't want uh, data to all be from just the most powerful power user. So they try to spread the love to all the different user IDs. They create a train test and validation split based off, off of user ID so that the test sets are from users that have never been seen in training. And they also filter out all PII from prompts in the training set. We talked about what those data sets are. Uh, I think it's interesting to look at the data set sizes in general. So for the structured fine tuning data set, they had those labelers collect over 10,000 examples, like 11,000 examples. Again, it's an expensive process. So you can imagine, yeah, they had 40 people doing this. I don't know how long it took them to collect 10,000 examples, but it's not cheap. And then they had those same ones go through and like rank them again. But again, it's not an absurdly massive data set here. It's like in the tens of thousands of examples. And then just to kind of be consistent, they don't really say how they pick these numbers. I'm guessing it's just a, they didn't want to spend more money on labeling. Um, but I just love to keep that in mind when they're like, oh, GPT, chat GPT is trained on all of the internet. It's like, yeah, it was at one point, but also there's this other step that's like very attainable from any company's perspective in my mind. They also mention that the data sets were 96% English. The workers were hired from Upwork and they were screened to be from different demographic groups. And they actually gave them some like example tasks and graded them before they were allowed to even label the data. Um, but at the end of the day, they said on all of these data sets, the inter annotator agreement about which things they preferred uh, was around 72%. So that's pretty high. Um, but also gives you a sense of like how often people might disagree on what a good response might be. Um, in terms of model architecture itself, this is something that Ben and I were joking about earlier today, but like all of these GPT papers uh, are pretty much the same model. And if you look at GPT versus GPT-2 versus GPT-3 versus Instruct GPT, there's pretty much the model and architecture section is kind of like one paragraph. And it's usually something like, we slightly tweaked the initialization, we added a sparse attention pattern, and we did it with all these different sizes. But it's not like there was a big groundbreaking thing in the model architecture itself. It's kind of more how they formulated the problem and how they collected the data set. But you can get a sense of all the experiments they ran with GPT-3 and all the different parameter sizes, uh, 175 billion being the biggest one that a lot of people talk about all the time. But this 1.3 billion, when you fine tune it, can beat it. And I feel like we're seeing a lot of open source LLMs coming out and people are like playing with these different sizes given their data and given their requirements. So if you want like a real time code generation thing that's running on your laptop next to your Visual Studio. If people could get that to work with one of these smaller models and it doesn't 
need to know anything about random question answering or whatever, that's a big win rather than having to make network network requests to a huge model sitting in the cloud. Um, so yeah, most of the paper is just talking about the, the data set and the formulation of the problem. See you, Aaron, great to have you. So they do get into a little bit uh, about each step, the supervised fine tuning, they trained it for 16 epochs, which means they really only went through that data set of, what was it, 11,000 examples. They showed that data set to the model 16 times, not super crazy. Um, and then some other just like parameters that they used, they mentioned. The reward model, they took this, the supervised fine tune model, they removed the last layer of it, and then they took the prompt and response pairs and just tried to output a number. So given this prompt, given this response, give me a number of how good this pair is. Uh, they said the final reward model that what they went with is the 6 billion parameter GPT-3 model was kind of like their uh, base of the model and they bootstrapped it to then become a reward model. So it's kind of interesting that like all of these different components that you look at in here are just GPT models <laughs> with slightly different objectives all put together in different ways. Um, and they said that the reward model itself was fine-tuned on a variety of public NLP data sets. Uh, all of these data sets have fun names that I have no idea what they mean until you kind of like dive into the data, but we did look at some of these last week. In terms of the metadata that they also collected uh, from labelers and what was, they're like, if we're already going through and having the label, labelers look at the outputs, let's also have them quantify what types of things we don't want it to output uh, or do want it to output. So these are some other metadata fields you could imagine a labeler when they're saying, I don't like this response, they say, I don't like it because it hallucinated or it contained violent content or whatever. And this just helped them have more metadata on not just a labeler saying they didn't like the response, but saying why they didn't. Um, they also, like, I kind of simplified the reinforcement learning part of it. They have some pretty complex looking equations in here and some knobs that they don't fully tell you how it tuned. So like to Ben's question earlier of how much of a bump did you get from here to here? They have all these little notes of like, well, we initialized our model this way and we used this objective function, but they don't really give you too much details there. It's a little, it's a little hand wavy. Um, and that gets to the results here. I think they had a lot of great lessons learned at the end of the paper as well. Some highlighting, okay, increasing the model alignment is modest relatively relative to the pre-training. So this is just uh, saying again that you can fine tune a smaller model and get better performance than this huge model and just save on compute. Um, they reiterate that they feel like it generalized to falling in instructions that they didn't see in the supervised data set. Uh, it's really hard to quantify some of these things, but they have just examples in the appendix of this. And then they were able to mitigate a lot of the performance degra degradations 
from the fine tuning. So that alignment tax that we talked about, they felt like, okay, this model that we supervised fine tuned did get worse on some of the task tasks because of this alignment task tax, but bringing in the next step made it good at both. Like they felt like it was a good balance of still doing really well on all those other data sets, but also being aligned to them. Yeah, I also liked how they brought in like <clears throat> the discussion a couple times about how those kind of more traditional NLP benchmarks are like maybe not what we're shooting for with this type of model, like something that is more helpful and like generative and creative. I think the sacrifice of like next word prediction to just be useful at all, I, I think they defended that really well too. Yeah, totally agree. And along those lines, just to give you a sense of like the before and the after, uh, this would be a raw GP3 175 billion completion. And this is the instruct one. And the, the prompt is, why is it important to eat socks after meditating, which is just a pretty ridiculous question in general. And the 75 billion, just like predict the next word model, continues it and plays along with it. It's like, what can you learn from socks? Answer, when you eat socks, you are tasting the essence of enlightenment. You are tasting the true flavor of the awakened mind. And like, it just kind of goes with it and just, just spitting out what a reasonable next word would be for somebody asking that question. And then since they fine tuned this to, uh, for some ridiculous questions, they say like, if you've ever seen chat GPT say, I'm a large language model and can't do that thing. That's pretty much what they're saying here. It's like, there's no clear answer to this question, but there are many theories and ideas that may, may explain the apparent need to eat socks after meditating. Still kind of ridiculous, but you can see just the difference in the type of responses here. <laughs> the true flavor and no flavor is the flavor of smelly feet. That's the great one too. <laughs> so the big question that they kind of pose at the end is who are we aligning to? Um, they have a big section describing this, but all things up to like, who's labeling the data, who's writing the prompts, who's evaluating the outputs of the models, how are they ranking them? Are the data and the labelers representative of humanity as a whole? Is it like just for your use case? Is it, you could imagine there's so many different ways that you could mix and match this fine tuning data set that, uh, they just really wanted to reiterate that that's the most important part here and, and needs a lot of thought and care. So I'll pause there for any questions or comments and I'll go find my Llama 2 examples, which I think are pretty fun and illustrative as well. Cool. So, one, let, uh, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I had one sort of comment or question is uh, because it's the next word prediction on the internet. Uh, I just wondered when when I was reading that is you know as these instruction data sets grow, the ability to in, uh, do some part of the pre training on the instruction data sets becomes um, a possibility. I'm wondering if there's any experiments that have been done. I'm wondering if Llama does this. Um, are they including mm. these instruction data sets in the pre-training data set? Does it seem to have any kind of benefit or is it kind of overruled by you know, just being such a small portion at this point? Um, and then, you know, are, are people talking about doing some, something like that in the future when these data sets do uh, grow to the right size? Yeah, that's a great question. And to give you a sense of the scale that like GPT-2, I just remember this from last week, it was like a 40 gigabyte dump of text that was, <laughs> it was filtered down to links that were shared on Reddit that had at least three karma points is how they kind of like filtered down that data set. And so if we think of this fine tuning data set, it might not even be a splash in the bucket of that but to your point yeah there there totally could be a world in which there's millions 
of these examples collected. And then it honestly gets really hard to then evaluate the model too, because then it's like, uh, you've now mixed all of these instructions into the pre-training data. And now we have to be very careful on what our held out data is. And if there's no transparency between the person evaluating the model and all of that pre-training data, then it's like, did you just overfit to those labels in the pre-training data set? It becomes a really hard problem to manage for sure. And I feel like that might be why we haven't seen a lot of research on it, but I would love to see some numbers on that. Great Greg, question and thought, yeah. Greg, it occurred to me when I was looking at the, the deduping part of the data set for a limit of number of prompts, 200 per user ID, that there's probably mm -hmm. some like interesting angle in there for obviously some version control. I imagine it's a pretty dramatic shift between which of the, which prompts make the set and which don't. Um, yeah. I know, any first thoughts on like how like how much variability comes in from just that step alone since it's an early step? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the key steps that people kind of forget about is there's a lot of data cleaning and pre-processing that goes on before this and little tricks like that, like making sure that you split your validation data set out by user ID, not just by like randomizing the prompts and splitting them is super important. And that's something that you could go back and like look at a previous version of the data and blatantly see, oh, user ID uh, is in the training data set and in the validation data set. And maybe that's why we're getting all these questions right in this domain, but getting all these wrong in another domain. So. I also think like with data at this scale, all of those kind of pre-processing tricks, I remember like, I think the words they use in the paper were like, that had a bunch of words in common at the beginning or something like that. It's just so heuristic that I think there's also a place for like having some type of traceability on those. Cause Greg, you mentioned earlier that people are struggling to reproduce the RLHF piece. You know what I mean? And obviously we don't have their full data set. If we did, it'd be a lot of fun, but yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and that also just begs to question, like when people say GPT-4 is the best model out there, to Ami's point, like, did they just put all of this data into that data set and like it is overfit to things that people ask or is it generalizing? It's really hard to tell <laughs> at that point. Because from a like product standpoint, you might just say, screw it, let's like put as much data as we want in there and not really worry about the fact that it's seen it before, because that might be a very useful thing to have a product have seen it before. So just to drive home the point on like these different models is Llama 2, I have the 7 billion one running locally. And this is the base model without any fine tuning. And so I said, write me a SQL statement to aggregate up a column named labels. And it continued it by saying, by the ID of the labels, and then continued it by saying, write me a SQL statement <laughs> to aggregate the column named labels by the ID of labels. And it just kept repeating itself over and over again. So it grammatically knows what sentences should look like, but obviously is not following my instruction at all. Then there's this Llama 2 7 billion chat model. And so I gave it the same prompt. It also completed it and said, and count the number of unique labels. For example, if the table has the following data and it like gives me an example table and then gives me what the SQL statement should return and then some more information about it, but never actually gives a SQL statement. Um, but you can see this is like, it was fine tuned to be a more chat thing. And it is kind of doing a chat thing where it's trying to elaborate on the problem more, um, but honestly didn't answer my question at all. So then they have one that is instruction fine tuned um, on code specifically. So this one has seen a lot of people asking questions about code, whereas the 
chat one has just seen a lot of chats in general. And so same prompt, write me a SQL statement to aggregate up column and labels. It puts a nice little period <laughs> on my sentence and then says begin code. It writes a SQL statement and code. And then it still kind of thinks it's in the state of like a, maybe a stack overflow or something. And it just starts spitting out like, uh, I want to get the count of each label and then people commenting on it and kind of gets into that repetitive pattern again. So you can see just from the evolution of these three, how training it on different data gives you much different responses. And you could see how uh, if you just wanted like a text to SQL type use case, you might collect a lot of data of just that and not have any of this post commentary and not have any of this elaboration and just do the task at hand. So obviously code llama 7 billion isn't GPT-3 175 billion, but it is something that a lot of people are playing with today on the open source space. So wanted to kind of see how people are, or show how people are tackling this today. So that's all I had for today. There's a lot of cool examples in the appendix. Like this paper is 100, or not, sorry, this paper is 68 pages long, but the actual content is like 18 or 19 pages. And then the abstract and appendices are just like a lot of qualitative examples that are kind of fun to read just if you're interested in them. That's all I had. Ami, was this helpful? Was this a format that you liked? Yeah, absolutely. I um, I, I wish a little more time for questions or discussion, but um, hopefully we can uh, get to those next time. We've got, I mean, we've got a few more minutes if you guys want to stick around. Um, I do. You guys have to bounce. It's fine too. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so uh, there's this great uh, newsletter that, that I read. I'll, I'll link it in the chat, but it sort of goes over RLHF mm -hmm. and some of the alternatives. I was just wondering what you guys' thoughts were. I don't know if you've seen constitutional AI from Anthropic. And uh, it, presumably, once you get a model, like you could, if OpenAI does a lot of the work, presumably that model gets really great. And now, like the whole idea of synthetic data. So, what if you have the data labeling done by this highly performant model? using sort of a set of guidelines um you know that's where the human portion comes in not in the labeling part i was just wondering what you guys thoughts on that because i think synthetic data i've just been seeing it more and more like people are using gpt4 to generate the data set because if you can have it generate a data set it's going to be probably better than any model that you're working with right so. yeah totally so you're saying like since that was so expensive in the human part and they could only collect 11,000 examples why don't we like leverage a production one that's been trained on way more to try to make a smaller one that's just on your subset is that kind of the idea here yeah and i guess just what are you guys thoughts more so on uh this kind of constitutional ai approach of giving it the guidelines and then i guess using uh, a sort of larger question of using uh large language models like gpt4 because it's pretty good um, to generate synthetic data. I think it's super interesting. I think it's one, I remember reading like OpenAI's legal guidelines on this and they definitely try to get people not to do this, but it's one of those things that's almost like when the cat is out of the bag and you go and do this and then you train your model and then there's another model trained off of that model, like you've kind of lost the traceability and I don't know how there's any way that they would enforce that. And in a world like that, I feel like people are just gonna do it regardless of the legal consequences because you can't even really trace that. So I think it's really promising in terms of uh, the use case I gave before of like, if you want a language model running on your local computer, maybe it's like a code completion thing and you just don't have enough data for that task yet go collect a bunch of it with GPT-4, cut them out of the loop, and then you kind of got your version locally that can do it. Um, but that's kind of like my hacker 
approach yeah. to it. What do you think, Ben? One like similar thing that kind of scares me. I, I think I like, I think it's a great point. And it's almost kind of akin to like distilling their model, although I don't think they would like it if we called it that, right? Because you can kind of feed its outputs into yours. One thing that I saw come up in a couple of like the really spicy papers that floated up back when we were in full like GPT-4 is AGI kind of world was that people were using GPT-4 as like the evaluating agent rather than like a text generator. So they're like asking GPT-4 um, like, hey, is this aligned? Was this like toxic? And GPT-4 is like, no, no problem. Uh, it re reminds me a lot of like the professor in Texas or whatever that was using asking GPT-4, did you write this essay about his students, you know, paper? I think that stuff gets super, super suspect, but I really like it for, um, you know, the the potential for like almost a cheaper and smaller distillation and, and some like, you know, if not perfect, very high quality training set generation for sure. Yeah, and to elaborate on that, Ben, like even when we were working on some of the text to SQL examples, there's multiple value, multiple valid SQL statements that could go with each prompt. It's like, are you doing count star or are you doing count on a specific field? And are you sorting that or are you not sorting that? But like it would still give you about a valid or the same output table. So what we did was like, that's really painful for us to go through and read every single SQL statement uh, in our thousand example test set. So why not have GPT-4 <laughs> go evaluate those things and give it a new task of saying, are these SQL statements equivalent or not? Um, but then you get in this weird, you get in this weird place where like you're trusting the model so much that it's correct. And then you're learning all of its biases. So I go back to like the best way is always going to be having humans in the loop. But I feel like this could just save a lot of filtering work and a lot of collecting data work, but putting in that work to just really make sure it's what you want is going to help you do, help it do really what you want rather than what the other one was trained on. Do you have any spicy takes have, on it, Ami? <laughs> I, I had another, yeah, just, you know, I, I agree. I think you do need some kind of human in the loop and open AI definitely has a responsibility because uh, everyone is, I think, trying to use their data as a way of shortcutting uh, you know, generating actual data sets themselves. Uh, like Alpaca, Vicuña, I think they were all sort of trained on chat GPT uh, responses. Uh, I sort of had a, a question just about, uh, you know, creating sort of a human in the loop feature. Uh, I'm of the opinion, like later, you know, down, many years down the line, uh, we might get to a stage where you sort of have that personal assistant. And whether it's sort of one personal assistant that's sort of with you um, that you can talk to or, or if it's multiple, um, like who knows? So I wonder what you guys think about, you know, you have ChatGPT right now they have a sort of thumbs up, thumbs down approach, which I don't think most people really do. I'm wondering what you guys think of adding a second persona um, into sort of that a chat interface that says, hey, you know, I am the second persona. I'm here to like, give me your thoughts on ChatGPT, because I know, you know, there's times when you get frustrated with it and you might be more inclined to use or talk to the second persona and kind of like pops up and ask you a question of what you guys or what the user thought about the response or, um, you know, maybe provided some, some other kind of information. Yeah, I mean, I think that's even interesting in terms of, I remember the table we showed that was like, why didn't you like this response? Uh, was it because it was violent or was it because it was incorrect or like a, a thumbs up and a thumbs down can't really get you that granular level of detail and i think there is something in being able to prioritize which things you do label and like if you're really optimizing for truthfulness okay maybe you have that second llm in the loop just even routing <laughs> to the right labeler to fix that problem um and I, I agree with your sentiment of, I feel there's gonna be a lot of variations of these models that are all kind of like specialized in different things. I think it's always this like, okay, we generalize as a species and then we like specialize as a species and you keep going back and forth between those. 
And so I feel like we saw a great leap in the generalization, but then there's always going to be people in a society who are trying to optimize to beat that general model. And then you kind of keep going back and forth. So those are my raw thoughts. I think it's really yeah, it's sort of, oh, sorry. I mean, coming from it from like a very like I have no technical AI background whatsoever. So coming at it from more of like a human perspective, um, I think it's really fascinating what you bring up around the persona because that brings back to what Greg highlighted in their commentary, which is who we're aligning to. So when you said you can have like potentially we have these multiple different personas, I'm like, oh, so further down the line, prospectively, will we have like slightly different alignments? that give rise to these slightly different people because obviously we all have our inherent biases and we'll be drawn towards certain ones um that's all that it made me think of is like you can end up with these slightly different variations and obviously you might prefer one set of alignments i might prefer a slightly different one um i think of the implications of that further on because i'm like okay then do you end up in your own echo chamber where you have these models that are just like validating what what you're looking for but anyway there's my two cents yeah and what if you pin them against each other yeah. <laughs> and you're like i want to talk to the one that's not aligned with me <laughs> <laughs> they mentioned that in the paper too just in a discussion of like okay 40 people is not a lot of people in terms of who were used to generate the, the kind of alignment data. And I'm sure that they, you know, did everything they could to, to select, you know, in a diverse way, but you cannot sum up humanity into 40 or 400 people. Um, and one of the suggestions they proposed was like, how do we feel about, you know, having it very personalized and catered to you? So yeah, I, I think that's super interesting. And Ami, to your point, like, the amount to which I would give those thumbs up and thumbs down and like communicate with that additional persona. I feel like if it was like my data that I got, you know, that would be used to personalize my model, I would do that so actively. I I kind of shut off my chat history and don't do those thumbs up and downs because I'm like, I'm not giving that to you guys for free. So that is funny. Yeah, like having your own personal, it's like I I have my chat that I know is never gonna leave my computer and I could even like yell at my model and be like no you stupid code completer or something and it's just like it's fine-tuned to my preferences or i'm really nice to my model i don't know do whatever you want but that is an interesting take on it from a personality perspective when you mentioned like having assistants or having like multiple different assistants it's like well if i can totally tailor it do i want an ass ass assistant that's like a mirror of me or do i want someone that's totally going to play devil's advocate do i want someone that thinks entirely different I don't know. Yeah, I love that. I always, I always just come back to like, there's 8 billion different people on the planet. I could imagine there being 24 billion different models, <laughs> you know, like four for each person that are all slightly fine tuned in a different way, so. I love yeah, that, Ben. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Ben said having an AI pair programmer that totally has a different style than me and disagrees on everything. That could be either annoying or the best thing of all time. But you could always exactly. turn it off. I'm just yeah. imagining Stack Overflow where everyone's like, no, my way. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't you doing dynamic programming here? <laughs> that is what it would say to me, to be fair. Cool. Well, thanks everybody. Josh or Adam, anything to add? No, this is like really informative stuff. And you know, coming from outside the ML space, just being able to learn this and take this in is is really great. Awesome. Yep. You're the only like comment so like far, Greg, is you might need a bigger time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 30 minutes. Get I guess we've coffee. been going over. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. I'm glad we I did like I like the back and forth, honestly, so maybe I'll even try to cut down the preamble a little more and save more time for that.